Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Carol Armstrong, a professor of art history at Yale. Professor Armstrong teaches and writes about 19th century French painting, the history of photography, the history and practice of art criticism, feminist theory, and the representation of women and gender in art and visual culture. She has published books and essays on Degas, Manet, Cezanne, and 19th and 20th century photography, and has curated several museum exhibitions. She is an art critic and has been a frequent contributor to October and Art Forum magazines. She is also a practicing photographer. Today we'll talk with Professor Armstrong about her book project, Cezanne's Gravity. Welcome, Professor Armstrong. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Of course. So um, let's begin with your book. Please give us an overview of it. OK, just to be very uh, uh, brief, it's about uh, the afterlives of the uh, painter Paul Cezanne, um, who is generally held to be uh, um, the father of uh, modernist, that is to say, 20th century abstraction. Um, it's a book that um, pairs Cezanne, or, or in some cases, put Cezanne together with two or more other figures, um, uh, with a variety of different kinds of, uh, of writers and um, thinkers uh, from the 20th century, mm -hmm. um, beginning with the poet um, Rainer Maria Rilke, who wrote letters to his uh, sculptor wife about uh, Cezanne when he saw his uh, work in the 1907 Autumn Salon, which was a, one of the sort of uh, array of different um, uh, exhibitions, um, exhi annual um, and biannual exhibitions um, that were replacing the old, uh, the old uh, state-sponsored um, salons. Mm -hmm. Um, then it proceeds with a, with a chapter um, that's uh, dedicated to Cezanne and his relationship uh, to, with the um, Bloomsbury uh, figure, Roger Fry, who was uh, also involved with um, Virginia Woolf and her painter sister, uh, Vanessa Bell. Mm -hmm. uh, Fry um, uh, was responsible for the term post-impressionism uh, with uh, an exhibition uh, in London in 19, um, 1910 um, that featured Cezanne, among, uh, among others, as the kind of father of a new era mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, art. But he wrote a, a book about Cezanne in 1927, which was the year in which Virginia Woolf uh, also uh, published her breakthrough um, novel to the to the lighthouse, mm -hmm. uh, which is about a a, a woman uh, painter. The third chapter from which I get the title for the book is about um, Cezanne and Einstein, as the sort of on the one hand the father of uh, a um, paradigm shift in art and the father of a paradigm shift in science. Mm -hmm. Um, though Einstein never, uh, never actually wrote um, about Cezanne in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, the fourth chapter is about Cezanne and the French uh, philosopher Merleau-Ponty, uh, who wrote extensively about, uh, about Cezanne uh, beginning in 1945. And then the final uh, chapter is concerned with uh, Cezanne uh, and various figures in the uh, psychoanalytic and um, neuro, uh, neuroscience um, uh, discipline from the early um, 20th century on to the, uh, to the present time. Okay. And what led you to write the book? Um, a number of things. I had done an exhibition on Cezanne and written uh, a book that went uh, with it at the, at the Getty back in 2004. Um, I wasn't sure that I wanted to write a, a monograph on Cezanne, but, uh, but I did want to come uh, back in a kind of selective way to, to Cezanne's very groundbreaking work. I wanted to extricate um, uh, Cezanne from um, uh, how he's been normalized as a, as a sort of father of abstraction and go back and look at the, and recover the strangeness of Cezanne's, uh, Cezanne's work. Mm -hmm. And then I also wanted to use Cezanne to reconsider um, and perhaps um, rethink the timelines of, uh, of 20th century art into which he's been put. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, 
when you say the strangeness of his work, what do you mean? Well, in, in thinking about Cezanne as, a, as the sort of father of abstraction, um, and people have tended, I think, uh, to, his, to see his work as going in the direction and leading sort of inevitably to abstraction. Mm -hmm. And so they've focused on a kind of um, 20th century understanding of, uh, of uh, Cezanne as um, really interested in the sort of flatness of the picture plane and, and really thinking in advance uh, of, of abstraction. And that, that's led to understanding him as a kind of pre-cubist, uh, pre-abstract um, figure. And I think that's not um, adequate to, uh, to an understanding of Cezanne. I, need, I think we really need to go back and, and sort of understand um, the the peculiarity of his work, the strangeness of the spaces mm -hmm. um, that he cre creates, the strangeness of the um, the sort of points of view, um, the way in which objects are peculiarly warped, um, mm -hmm. the very peculiar relationship between objects and space that we find in his right. uh, work, among other things. Okay, so you mentioned Virginia Woolf, Einstein, and then. Um, in the realm of the neuro um, uh, cognitive processing, how do those all relate? Uh, okay, well, since these are all about the sort of afterlives of uh, of Cezanne, um, sort of three out of uh, five of the chapters are concerned with uh, people who actually wrote figures who actually wrote uh, and or were thinking about uh, Cezanne. Mm -hmm. um, two of the chapters are um, concerned with, uh, with the chapter on Einstein and the chapter on um, uh, psychoanalysis and, uh, uh, and uh, neurocognitive processing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are, are concerned with figures who didn't actually write about Cezanne, so there's a more indirect um, connection. Um, but in all cases, we are looking at uh, the afterlife. Mm -hmm. um, but the afterlife of this of this uh, painter, f uh, sort of phenomenally influential um, uh, painter, um, as sort of thought about um, from a fresh um, uh, point of view, mm -hmm. to emphasize the peculiarity of the uh, of the uh, work. Um, you know, sort of Virginia Woolf uh, it, uh, is interested and was interested, as was Roger Fry, um, the art critic and, and curator, um, in sort of rethinking the the timelines of uh, modernity mm -hmm. um, and the experience of time mm -hmm. uh, in modernity. And I want to argue um, about uh, Cezanne that that he too makes us think about the the time of uh, the painting or of, uh, of art history um, mm -hmm. uh, differently uh, as well. As for the um, neurocognitive processing, it has more recently been argued by a number of uh, figures who work in so-called neuro art history or neuro aesthetics mm -hmm. um, that we can look at Cezanne and famous aspects of his work like the unfinish um, of his paintings. Uh, uh, the fact that they leave parts of the canvas bare, mm -hmm. that you can see um, uh, some parts of the canvas will look uh, more complete and other parts will have sort of brushwork that is very loosely um, related to a motif that you can recognize. Mm -hmm. So it's been argued um, uh, that, um, that we can look at his work in relation to cognitive um, processes of how the brain makes sense mm -hmm. of, um, of the world. I'd like to take a look um, back at those ideas mm -hmm. um, from the vantage point of the uh, philosopher Merleau-Ponty who suggested um, very hypothetically uh, in 1945 that Cezanne may have been schizoid. Um, uh, which was a term and an idea that was circulate, beginning to circulate in uh, the fields of psychology and, uh, and psychoanalysis. And based on what, do you think? Based on the oddity of his work and also certain oddities of his, uh, of his um, uh, biography. Uh -huh. um, it's Merleau-Ponty was a philosopher of, uh, of something called phenomenology. Um, and part of the 1945 essay, which was called Cezanne's Doubt, uh, was to kind of revisit um, and um, uh, 
and sort of rethink uh, our ideas about the relationship between an artist's life uh, and, their, uh, and their work. So it's a hypothesis which he's very clear um, cannot be a diagnosis, mm -hmm. um, uh, but which depends upon uh, a kind of strange relationship between the things that Cezanne is representing mm -hmm. and the kind of unfolding uh, way in which they are um, mm -hmm. uh, represented. Um, has Cezanne ever written, or has anyone written for him, his thoughts, um, what he was thinking when he was painting? Yeah, there was a lot of, uh, of writing. Um, uh, Cezanne's own letters were collected, and uh, towards the end of his life, um, he, was, uh, he became a kind of apocryphal um, figure. He went from being um, someone who next to Van Gogh was the least um, successful in terms of selling mm -hmm. uh, work or, or uh, receiving critical, um, uh, uh, or in terms of critical um, success in the Parisian um, art market. He, um, uh, for the most of his life, kept uh, in his hometown of Aix-en-Provence. Um, he was, but he was known for sort of uh, saying sort of rather, um, uh, for rather sphinx-like um, utterances, mm -hmm. but when he began to be exhibited in Paris in the last decades of the uh, of the nineteenth century, and younger artists, emerging um, artists, um, began to write up his apocrypha, began to visit him, um, and began to transform him into to what we now know him as, which is the sort of father or the primitive, as they put it. Uh, of modern art, there was a sort of ser collected series of, of, uh, um, of sayings that are attributed um, to Cezanne, which we can either find in his letters mm -hmm. or uh, in these apocryphal um, collections. Right, right. Um, let's talk about Einstein a little bit. Um, tell us how Einstein's work is related to Cezanne's work. Okay, um, Einstein is usually related to modern art um, uh, through um, a kind of popularization of the mathematics, um, uh, the non-Euclidean mathematics um, uh, that uh, Einstein relied upon uh, for his theories of relativity, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, which were first published in 1905, um, a year before Cezanne's death, okay. and then later in uh, 1915. Um, Usually, the connection between these sort of popularized versions of non-Euclidean um, um, geometry um, uh, and the so-called fourth dimension, um, which was the popular version mm -hmm. of uh, of what would become known as relativity, uh, the connection to art is made through cubism. Um, first in 1911, the poet Apollinaire, and then the next year in 1912, when two um, uh, in two cubist followers of Picasso and uh, Braque, uh, the painters Glaze and Metzanger wrote up a book called Cubism in which mm -hmm. they related cubism uh, to the fourth dimension and mm -hmm. to the geometry that was created by uh, Riemann. So usually when we think of, of relativity and uh, a kind of watered-down version of Einstein's ideas, uh, and modern art, we think of cubism. I and want Picasso, to push it back. Right, to, okay. And yeah. why do you want to do that? Um, because I actually, because partly because of the um, the the way in which Cezanne, like um, Einstein, um, stands as a kind of um, uh, revolutionary um, figure who uh, revol revolutionized his field, just as Einstein revolutionized his field. But also because of, I think that some of the the less well understood aspects of of Einsteinian uh, relativity correspond better to the look of Cezanne's um, uh, pictures. So, for example, um, uh, the non-Euclidean geometry that Einstein was looking at was really a, a geometry of curved space, mm -hmm. which uh, it applies much better to um, the kind of undulations, the focus on round objects. Uh, on a space that um, sort of keeps um, flowing and moving, um, um, which corresponds a little bit better to uh, the curved space of, uh, of relativity. Because also um, Cezanne's spaces are um, ones in which time and space come together. 
so that instead of the picture corresponding to a single instant in time, mm -hmm. which had been uh, the, the sort of classical idea of what a, a pictorial space was, um, you have a picture which corresponds to an eye which keeps moving in time, mm -hmm. um, shifting from one point of view to another point of view to another point of view, um, in mo for always in motion, um, which is, uh, I think, much closer uh, to the uh, to uh, the sense of what happens in relativity, which is you have multiple viewers mm -hmm. um, uh, who and the time space-time um, uh, continuum that Einstein speaks of uh, is really in relation to a series of viewers ha who have um, different vantage points and mm -hmm. are moving at different uh, rates um, uh, relative to each other, mm -hmm. um, hence relativity. Right. Um, and I think that corresponds better to what happens in what I would call the space-time of, of, of Cezanne's mm -hmm. um, paintings. If you had to pick one of Cezanne's paintings um, as your favorite, what would it be and why? Oh dear. Um, well, I would pick a, uh, one of his still lives, and the, this is a book that really does co um, um, correspond to his, um, uh, to focuses on uh, that um, uh, genre. And I suppose, I don't have one single um, mm -hmm. favorite painting. Uh, but there's a kind of culminating, uh, very famous um, uh, still life called The Apples and, the or and Oranges, um, which is a very luscious um, uh, uh, painting, which uh, does everything that I've just described sort of in spades. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are multiple vantage points. There are um, a kind of proliferating world of, of objects um, sort of rolling about in a space which won't stay put, which keeps moving. Um, and which keeps curving um, and shifting around those different uh, objects. Um, so that would be one of my, uh, mm -hmm. my picks for a favorite Cezanne. Okay, and when um, will Cezanne's gravity um, be available? <laughs> well, um, probably not be for another couple of years. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of nearing the end of the, of the first draft of the, of the book, and it will have to be. Um, uh, go through edits and, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, we will look forward to seeing that then. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you again. For more information about Professor Armstrong, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.